Achieving a good outcome for the United Kingdom from Brexit will be a complex and difficult task. It will be particularly complex and difficult in the case of Northern Ireland. One factor is that a clear majority of those voting in the referendum in Northern Ireland, 56%, voted to remain in the European Union. Second, there is the political background of strife between the unionist and nationalist communities and the continuing peace process. Third, there is the complex web of institutions for governing Northern Ireland set up following the Belfast Agreement. And fourth, there is the fact that after Brexit there will be a land border between two states, one inside the EU and the other outside it, running through the island of Ireland. A border at which there are currently no border controls. One of the concerns is that the peace process might be upset by Brexit. The other major concern is that Brexit will result in the imposition of border controls which will impede the free movement of people, goods and services that currently exists, damaging the economies of Northern Ireland, Ireland and the United Kingdom. This short video concentrates on the third of those complicating factors that were mentioned, the governance of Northern Ireland. It has already been agreed that what happens to Northern Ireland and its border with Ireland will be key issues in the negotiations between the UK and the EU, which formally began on 19th June 2017. Although Brexit itself has been highly controversial, there appears to be a broad consensus about the objectives of negotiating Brexit so far as they relate to Northern Ireland. The UK government, the government of Ireland, representatives of EU institutions and of the member states have all stressed the importance of continuing to support the peace process in Northern Ireland and of avoiding the creation of a hard border between Northern Ireland and Ireland. The political parties in Northern Ireland itself have different views on Brexit, with the Democratic Unionist Party arguing for leaving the EU in the referendum campaign, whereas other parties argued for Remain. But the DUP is also against a hard border after Brexit. It is less clear precisely how that might be achieved, but to understand what might happen, it helps to understand how Northern Ireland is governed. The Belfast Agreement of 1998, also known as the Good Friday Agreement, paved the way for a new system of devolved government for Northern Ireland, which has three strands. Strand one, is an elected power-sharing assembly and executive government for Northern Ireland. Strand 2, the North-South Strand, was designed to encourage cooperation across the island of Ireland and consists of institutions representing governments on both sides of the border. Strand 3, the East-West Strand, was designed to encourage cooperation and develop good relations between Britain and Ireland and consists of the British-Irish Council and the British-Irish Intergovernmental Conference. These are forums in which the UK and Irish governments meet. So, what are the implications of Brexit for this system of governance? Let's take the Northern Ireland Assembly and Executive Government, Strand 1. These institutions are based on the principle of consociationalism. They are designed to emphasise the political equality of two communities in Northern Ireland, that is, the Nationalist and the Unionist, and to accommodate their interests. The mechanisms of devolved government are intended to ensure that neither community can dominate the other, and in particular, neither can impose on the other measures which would affect the other's core interests. If the representatives of one community are concerned about proposed legislation, the Northern Ireland Act 1998 allows them to present a petition of concern. That means the legislation will only be adopted if it receives cross-community support. Whilst this is an essential feature of devolved government, there is a concern that it is sometimes misused to block measures which a party is opposed to politically, but which do not really affect the core concerns of a community. This possibility has been there since the current system of devolution was set up, but Brexit magnifies it because there are important devolved policy areas which are heavily constrained by EU law, for example, agriculture, environmental law and employment law. And there are more such areas than there are in relation to Scotland or Wales, 
because more policy areas are devolved than in relation to Scotland or Wales. So if the veto is misused, it may inhibit future policy development in devolved matters. Another issue is how Northern Ireland's interests are recognised given that Brexit is being negotiated by the UK government for the UK as a whole. How will the interests of Northern Ireland be taken account of in the negotiation process? The formal mechanism for coordinating the views and interests of different parts of the UK is the Joint Ministerial Committee on EU Negotiations, on which there are represented the leaders of the devolved administrations of Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. The devolved administrations have already indicated what their wishes and priorities are, but the UK government has not made a detailed response, so it is unclear which of those might be accepted as part of its negotiating position and which might be rejected. What is clear is that Northern Ireland's elected political representatives do not have a legal veto over the negotiating position that the UK government chooses to adopt. But further down the line, there may be constitutional difficulties arising from the need to give domestic legal effect to withdrawal from the EU. It will certainly be argued that the so-called Great Repeal Bill requires the consent of the Northern Ireland Assembly in accordance with the Sewell Convention. I will now move on to the North-South dimension. This strand of devolution represents the aspirations of the nationalist community and the interests of the people of Ireland by creating a framework to encourage cooperation across the island of Ireland and to encourage cross-border institutions, namely the North-South Ministerial Council and the North-South Implementation Bodies. There are six areas of cooperation. These are areas in which common policies and approaches are agreed in the Council but which are implemented separately on either side of the border. The six areas are agriculture, education, environment, health, tourism and transport. There are six North-South implementation bodies which are jointly funded by the two administrations. The staff are civil servants, some of whom are directly recruited and some of whom have been transferred or seconded from their departments in the Irish and Northern Ireland civil services. They include Waterways Ireland, the Food Safety Promotion Board and the Trade and Business Development Body. Leaving the EU would complicate the work of these bodies because in areas such as agriculture, EU law would apply south of the border but not north of the border. This will make it more difficult to achieve common approaches. And this links back to strand one because there may be difference of view between the nationalist and unionist politicians in Ireland on how much all-Ireland cooperation there should be. If unionist politicians block cooperation sought by nationalists, that will lead to the latter being frustrated. In this way, the relaxation of the EU law constraints might lead to greater political tension within Northern Ireland. The Belfast Agreement also provided for the setting up of a British-Irish Council, whose purposes are to promote the harmonious and mutually beneficial development of the totality of relationships among the peoples of these islands. The membership of the British Irish Council comprises representatives from the Irish Government, United Kingdom Government, Scottish Government, Northern Ireland Executive, Welsh Government and the governments of the Isle of Man, Jersey and Guernsey. The British Irish Council meets in three different formats. First, it meets twice a year at summit level. Secondly, it meets in specific sectoral formats on a regular basis. Thirdly, it meets in whatever format is deemed appropriate to discuss cross-sectoral matters. The Belfast Agreement states that the British Irish Council will normally operate by consensus when deciding on common policy or actions, it operates by agreement of all the members participating in the relevant policies or actions. The other East-West institution set up under the Belfast Agreement is the British-Irish Intergovernmental Conference. According to the agreement, it should deal with the totality of relationships and establish a standing British-Irish Intergovernmental Conference, which would bring together the British and Irish governments to promote bilateral cooperation at all levels on all matters of mutual interest within the competence of both governments. There are regular meetings of the British-Irish Council, but the Intergovernmental Conference was last held in 2007. 
and in answer to a parliamentary question in March 2016, the United Kingdom government said that there were no plans to hold a meeting of the conference in the immediate future. Having said that, the two governments do meet regularly in other contexts. The difficulty posed by Brexit is not a lack of arrangements for the governments of the UK and Ireland to meet. It is the fundamental difficulty of reconciling their very different goals in relation to Brexit. And so far, just as it is unclear how much the UK government might concede to accommodate the views of the devolved administration on Brexit, so it is unclear how much it would concede to accommodate the views and interests of the Irish government. These issues are going to keep us occupied for a long time. The information released following the opening of negotiations between the UK and the EU on 19th June suggested that issues relating to Northern Ireland will not be quickly resolved. The agreed terms of reference for the Article 50 negotiations state that a dialogue on Ireland and Northern Ireland has been launched, but apparently this will not be in the first wave of working groups and would be subject to a separate, slower dialogue.